what I want to do is I want to start off by telling you a tale of two people. I want to tell you about two different people. If I was creative, I would have named them with some fake names, but then I would have had to remember what those names were. So we're going to call them person one and person two. We're going to be really creative. Uh, person one is a 25-year-old white female who grew up in New York and went to private school for most of her life. Person number two, also 25 and white, identifies as male and went to public school. Based on income alone, she would probably be considered in the mid to upper middle class, whereas he grew up in the lower half of the middle class. He was an all around good athlete growing up, playing basketball, soccer, hockey, football, anything the, the school had to offer. And she was an elite athlete, focusing on fencing. She was recruited by the Air Force Academy to fence Division I, and while there studied French and astronautical engineering. He went to Penn State and studied aerospace engineering. After graduating from the Air Force Academy, she got a commission as a lieutenant. And after a year and a half at Penn State, he started his first active duty job. She's a project engineer for an acquisition squadron. And he works in interpersonal violence prevention. She's married to her best friend from high school, and they're planning on having kids in a couple of years. He married the beautiful woman that he started dating in college. And he would have kids yesterday if he could. After the Air Force, she's considering becoming a chartered financial analyst and joining the family business. He's currently studying to become an EMT. Do you feel like you maybe have a good idea of what these two people may be like? Maybe what they look like? I want to show you their pictures and see if you're close. So this is her picture. And this is his. Did they look similar? Maybe even familiar? They should, because in reality, they're the same person. And they're both me. Person one is how the world tends to view me, based on what they hear or what they see. And person number two is more how I view myself and how those closest to me may see me. I'm 25 years old, white, and every form of identification that I have says I'm female. The problem is that I never felt all that much like a girl growing up. For as long as I can remember, I felt like I should have been born a boy and that there was nothing I could do about it. Now, at this point, you may correctly identify me as transgender. But with that comes a lot of assumptions about who I am and what I want and how I live my life that may or may not actually be true. According to Merriam-Webster, the definition of transgender is someone who identifies with or expresses a gender identity other than that which they were assigned at birth. Now, you'll notice that there's no mention of hormones in this definition, no surgeries, not even changing your name or your pronouns. Because while some people who are transgender choose to do one or all of these things, none of them are a prerequisite for identifying as transgender. Personally, I have no intention of undergoing hormone therapy, having surgeries, or even changing my name or my pronouns. To address some of these other apparent contradictions in the columns, I grew up in upstate New York. I went to private school for the majority of my life on financial aid before I transferred to public school for high school. I dabbled in a lot of sports in middle school before settling on fencing around the eighth grade. And I did that in an elite level, competing for the United States for five years. I was recruited by the Air Force Academy. And after four years there, went to Penn State for my master's degree. Shortly after finishing my master's degree, I came out here to Shriver to start my first full-time job, active duty, as a project engineer. But I spend most of my time coordinating the Green Dot Prevention Program here on base. Uh, I've taught some of you in the audience. Um, I am married to a beautiful woman who also happens to be my best friend of nearly 10 years. And as bad as I want kids, uh, we are going to plan on waiting until I'm out of the Air Force. At that point, uh, to be honest, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Um, I am currently working on becoming an EMT. But I would like to have two or three or maybe four kids. And it's hard to support a family uh, of that size on EMT pay. So I'm looking at other things like becoming a chartered financial analyst and going to work with my wife. Um, as I described to you these two people initially, you begin to build a picture without me necessarily even asking you to build a picture of who they are. And we do this automatically. We do it based on the way that I labeled and described them. And the problem with that is that your, your assumptions of who they are 
are based on the way that I labeled and described them. Because until I tell you that they're me, you've never met these people before. You don't know who they are. But based on the 12 labels that I've assigned to them, you make a judgment about who they are. You decide who they may be. In a sense, each column describes me, but neither one tells the full story. If you really want to know who I am, you need to know what's in both columns. But even more importantly, you need to know the stories behind those columns. Why did I choose those words? Why, are, why is that the me that I show to the world? In the article, 10 Pieces of Advice from LGBT Millennials to Those Coming Out Late in Life, Carrie Poppy put it well, saying, we're asked when we come out to choose a label that can identify to others quickly a Rolodex of information about ourselves, which is really just a bunch of stereotypes and confining ideas about who we are. So as I describe to you these two people, you hear the way that I describe and label them and you formulate an idea of who they may be. And the problem with doing this is that you form it based on assumptions about what it means to identify with those groups or what it means to maybe know someone in one of those groups. Usually you're not forming those assumptions based on first-hand knowledge. We tend to do it based on stereotypes. The problem with doing this is that we don't necessarily know anything about the person who we're making assumptions about. We do it based on very little information about who they actually are. Just because two people share a label doesn't mean that they necessarily share a story. And yet we find ourselves on a regular basis making assumptions about people based simply on the labels that they choose to identify with. As an exaggerated example, nearly half of the world identifies as female. And yet we wouldn't begin to believe that they're all the same simply because they identify with that same label. And yet on a smaller scale, we find ourselves doing exactly that with other labels. Assuming that all Muslims, Christians, gun owners, gun control advocates, Democrats, Republicans, Caucasians, African Americans, cops, members of the LGBT community, we could go on and on are all the same simply because they identify with the same label. Now I don't want to stand, well I'm not really standing, I don't want to sit here and tell you that this is all a bad thing and that we need to stop. Because the reality is that even if you made a conscious effort to, you couldn't. As humans, this is something that we do, labeling and categorizing on a regular basis in that caveman part of our brain that's always trying to keep us safe. It's something that we do automatically, usually without conscious thought. So you can't really stop altogether. And that's actually really important because even in 2016, there are places in this country where as a Muslim, African American, cop, member of the LGBT community, you can reasonably fear for your safety and maybe your life. In 2009, I was discussing the potential repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell with some of my fellow airmen. And one that I didn't know all that well said, if I found out that someone in our squadron was gay, I would kill them. Now, like I said, I didn't know him that well. And to be honest, at that point in my life, I wasn't out to anyone. I couldn't be 100% honest with you and say that I was out to myself. But hearing him say that triggers a reaction in that caveman part of your brain that's trying to keep you safe. And it made me realize that, gay or not, I was in an environment where somebody would be willing to kill me over a difference in choice of labels. So when I meet someone new for the first time, I find that it's most comfortable for everyone if I initially discuss the labels that are least controversial about myself. I'm from New York. I fence. I went to Penn State. And I do this not because I'm ashamed to be gay or because I'm not confident in who I am or even because I don't want to answer their follow-on questions. I do it because while we've come a long way with acceptance, we still have a long way to go. We still live in very divided times. So while my conscious brain is trying to have a conversation with this new person and learn about them and tell them things about me, that caveman part of my brain is running a million miles an hour trying to dissect everything about this person's tone, choice of words, body language, to decide whether or not I'm safe in that situation and how much I can safely reveal about myself. And while most of that processing happens at a fairly unconscious level, it can be exhausting to always be thinking that way. I want to live in a world where I can let my caveman brain relax just a little bit. I want to be able to walk up to somebody who I've just met 
and tell them that I'm a gay, transgender New Yorker who proudly serves in our Air Force without feeling like I may be putting myself or my family at risk by doing so. <laughs> Sorry. But the only way that we're going to be able to do that, the only way that we come close to being in a world where I can do that, is if we can start to see our labels as things that unite us rather than divide us. As part of your registration today, many of you have identified on your name tags communities that you're a part of. And walking around today and at lunch, you may have noticed that there's a number of people here with whom you share at least one community or a label. And that can be a lot of fun because it gives you the opportunity to break ice with someone you've never met. You can talk to a total stranger about a shared experience or other things that you have in common based on your communities. Personally, I'm a member of a number of communities. I'm human. One of about seven billion of us on this planet right now. Of all humans, there are a lot of Americans. I'm one of them. Among all Americans, about 166 million of us were assigned the female sex at birth. Of all American women, about 10 million are from New York. About 7,000 of us currently served in the armed forces, 2,200 in the Air Force. Of them, 440 are officers, about 100 of which received our commissions from the Air Force Academy. 27 went on to receive master's degrees as junior officers. And to my knowledge, I may be wrong, I'm the only one who got that master's degree from Penn State. We are. Each of the 7 billion of us on this planet can make one of these trees of our communities and our sub-communities. And while we share a community with a number of people, we share a sub-community with fewer and fewer people the farther we go. Until if you go deep enough, you're the only one left. Each of the seven billion of us on this planet has a variety of experiences that make each of us unique. And that diversity makes life interesting. It keeps us engaged with the world around us. It stops us from living out the book The Giver in real life. And diversity is not a foreign concept to us. We hear schools and jobs and companies and teams talking about their diversity all the time. And we see a lack of diversity causing issues like Oscar's so white. And it's not uncommon to hear people say things like the color of their skin shouldn't matter or I don't see gender. And on the surface, these seem like good things. They seem like positive statements. But if you really think about it, what you're saying is you don't see a part of my identity. And if you don't see a part of my identity, then how will you ever really see me? How can you ever really know me? Diversity strengthens our communities. It makes us more resilient. It helps in the very survival of our species. But the only way that we can draw on the most powerful aspects of diversity is to acknowledge that we are, in fact, diverse. Even within the smallest sub-communities, we have differences in experience that make each of us unique. And by opening those dialogues and talking about those experiences, we allow ourselves to learn from the experiences of others without ever having to experience those things ourselves. We have this vastly powerful tool of experiential learning in front of us, and yet we aren't using it to its fullest potential. As we conclude our session today and after you leave TEDx Shriver, I challenge you to find those in your communities and talk to them about your experiences. What do you have in common? What do you not? What can you learn from each other? Find those with whom you don't share a sub-community and find something that you do have in common. If absolutely nothing else, you share with them the fact that you are a member of our human community, deserving of respect, even if you disagree on everything and you can't understand each other. And that's a fact that as a world, we would do well to remind ourselves of more often. Thank you.